as the kids are gone, um, let's pray. Father, uh, we, we thank you um, for your presence. We thank you for this space that while our auditorium is torn apart, we can still gather uh, like this and we can still worship. We can still be together. We can still hear from you. And we, um, we ask the Holy Spirit in this space that you would speak to us. That we would set aside the distractions. We would set aside stuff that maybe we have to deal with when we leave this place. That we would set aside maybe even uh, conflict um, with the person we're sitting next to. Um, that we'd be able to focus on you and give our attention to you and honor you and worship you and hear from you this morning. And so we, we praise you and we thank you, Jesus, for the presence in this place that we can worship and we can um, be together and um, have a good time and have fun in a place like this. Um, we're just grateful. We ask that you would speak to us this morning. We pray this year. Amen. Amen. Well, we're continuing with the idea of hope in the desert. Um, we're talking about a, a subject I'm very familiar with this morning, and it is the idea of disobedience. Um, hope in the desert of disobedience. I don't know about you, but when I was a kid in school, um, I was very familiar with the principal's office. <laughs> I had a path worn to that place. Um, we had just moved to school when I was in first grade in Indiana, and within about a month, I had punched a kid in the nose. Um, he deserved it. Um, that story will be for another time. Um, but I got paddled in school. I don't even remember days of time when you could get paddled in school. And how many of you got paddled in school? <laughs> All right, I'm not alone. Nice, even some ladies. Nice. Well, I thought maybe I was just alone. But yeah, paddled in school. And, and I, I got paddled by my mom and dad more times than I can count. Um, most of them I deserve. Um, probably all of them. Um, but discipline and disobedience kind of go hand in hand, don't they? Um, disobedience can be fun, let's be honest. Disobedience can be fun, but it's usually for a season, for a short period of time. And then the discipline and those in authority, those in charge, whatever, it usually catches up to us. But disobedience can be fun for a time. There can be freedom in that we feel like, well, we're giving it to the man, you know, or we're kind of doing our own thing, or doing what we want, and we have this sense of freedom to do our own thing, to be our own person, to kind of be a little bit of a rebel, and to, you know, there, there could be some fun in that, but 99 times out of 100, there are consequences that eventually catch up to us, especially if the disobedience is serious, if the disobedience, um, you know, is bad enough, discipline catches up to us. Y'all familiar with the story of Israel and how Israel had this cycle of sin and then going into captivity and then redemption and then sin and then uh, captivity and then redemption and over and over and over again there is this cycle in their life that they follow throughout all of their history. Some of you may be able to identify with that, where you can, sit, where you can uh, think of your own life where, oh, there's this thing that I struggle with, and I find myself doing it, and I don't want to do it, and I hate it, but I end up doing it anyway, and then I repent, and I've done it enough times that I wonder, can God really forgive me again? Anybody ever been in that place before and said those things and gone through that feeling and go, where does God's grace extend to and how bad um, can, I be, can I be, can I get, and God still forgive me? And I've done this so many times and I've asked forgiveness so many times that we go back and forth and we struggle and we, we really are sorry, we really do repent, we really do ask for forgiveness, but is God frustrated enough with me that I'm going to stay in this desert forever because when we're living in disobedience, when we're living in this place, it, it frequently feels like a desert. It frequently feels like God is distant 
typically because he is, because he typically, you know, when we go into disobedience, he, he doesn't support that, and so his presence can feel distant because we know that we need to repent, we know that we need to turn around. He doesn't need to be there to convict us because we already know. I think most of us, most of the time, we know when we've been bad. We know when we're sinning. We know when we're making mistakes. Most of us know it. And the same thing is true for Israel. The same thing is true in this story that I'm going to read just an introduction to. So in the book of Nehemiah, the letter of Nehemiah, this is a, I, I read through the Bible, I've seen this many times. It was a, I was on a prayer retreat oh, years ago, and I love the Old Testament. <coughs> And I started reading in Nehemiah, and I came across chapter 9 of Nehemiah. We're going to read the first three verses of Nehemiah. So if you have your Bibles, I'd encourage you to open them. If you have your phones, open the app. If you don't have an open app, download an app, open it, and turn to this account of Nehemiah. In Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 1, I'm not reading out of the New Living Translation, and that's what's up here on the screen for you. It says, on October 31st, the people assembled again, and this time they fasted and dressed in burlap and sprinkled dust on their heads. Those of Israelite descent separated themselves from all foreigners as they confessed their own sins and the sins of their ancestors. They remained standing in place for three hours while the book of the law of the Lord their God was read aloud to them. Then three more hours they confessed their sins and worshipped the Lord their God. How many of you would like to stand this morning and have a six-hour service? <laughs> All while standing. How many of us could spend three hours confessing our sins? I won't ask you to hold your hand up for that question. But this is the, the when we get to this place in chapter 9, they were in a desperate place. They were in this desert of disobedience. Uh, the walls had been torn down. You have to go back and read Ezra and Nehemiah. They were in exile. They had been taken away in captivity. Uh, the temple was destroyed. The walls were broken down. Then. Every, um, so they were in this desert of, they had lost their safety because the walls had been torn down. They had lost their connection to God because the temple was destroyed. Everything that they looked at, every place around them was this, place of discouragement and they knew they deserved to be there. They were in this place because they had disobeyed and God sent them into exile. And so they were so committed, they were so passionate, they spent three hours just reading from the book of the law, which would have been the first five books would have been Genesis, Exodus, Vegas, Numbers, Zero. They have been reading this law for three hours standing and then they spent three hours standing, confessing. If we stand for five minutes singing songs, like, oh, good leg starts to hurt, good back starts to hurt. I don't know, I've had a few back surgeries, and then you stand too long, and start doing this, start doing this, and you kind of squat a little bit, and you kind of rub some muscles, and you, you kind of get a little distracted by what's going on. Oh, what did we say? What did that guy stand up front and say? I can't concentrate you. Man, these seats are not comfortable. And I've, I've heard about some of these seats and sitting in the seat in here for an hour. You know, it's not comfortable. How desperate are we to hear from God? And I look at the story, and what, what strikes me about this is their passion to see and to hear from God. And you look through this, and, and if you take, I want to encourage you um, today to look at, at chapter 9. Because as you read through chapter 9, if you have your Bibles, I just, again, encourage you. If you look in the kind of in verse 16, it talks about, it, it, it begins to go through this cycle. It goes through this cycle of they were disobedient, and then God redeemed them. And so you kind of have this one for one. You have this disobedience, then they go into exile, they repent, God hears them, God in His grace restores them. So over and over and over again, by my count, there's about six times through this passage, through this one chapter, it's kind of a summary of their history. In this one chapter, there's these six instances where there's sin, there's redemption. There's sin, there's redemption. There's rebellion, there's rejection, there's redemption. Back and forth it goes between over years of God's grace, God's judgment, 
repentance, grace, you know, over and over again. And it kind of ends where, where in this place they are now is in this place of rebellion, this place of disobedience. And they're crying out to God, God, again, we're asking you for your grace. We're asking you again for your mercy. And again, look at chapter, or still chapter 9, verse uh, verse 28 then, the last part of verse 28 there. Um, Yet, whenever your people turn and cry to you again for help, you listen once more. You listen once more from heaven. In your wonderful mercy, you rescued them. How often? Many times. Then look down at verse 31. Verse 31. Uh, but in your great mercy, you did not destroy them completely or abandon them forever. What a gracious and merciful God you are. If you have your Bibles, if you have a bed, these are some verses you need to be underlined. If you dog your pages, and I mean some of you library people, you don't dog your pages, right? That's just but it, mark this passage, mark these verses, mark this section that, that, that Nehemiah is recounting God's amazing grace, amazing mercy, that you could probably say, well, they didn't really deserve it. Because of how many times they had done this. But each time there was repentance, each time they were serious, each time they were intentional and they sought God, they realized their sin, they confessed their sin, and God shows up. Verse 33, every time, every time you punished us, you were being just. We had sinned greatly and you gave us only we deserve it. We can struggle with this, can't we? How many of you have ever been angry with God? How many of you have ever been frustrated, upset, ticked off? I, I appreciate the honesty. <laughs> I have. I mean, God does things like, I, I just don't understand. This doesn't make sense, God. What are you doing? I, I'm, I'm ticked. I'm ticked. And, and I can't pretend to explain God. I can't pretend to explain His ways or why He does what He does or, or the reasons and the things that happen. I, I can't explain that. I, I, I know that God is just. I know that God is right. I know that God is sovereign and in control. But I know we live in a broken, sinful world and that bad things happen because we live in a broken, sinful world. I, can't explain other than that. But when it comes to discipline and when it comes to us living in disobedience, it, it's hard because, I mean, how many of us would be willing to say this? How many of us would be willing to say, like Nehemiah, every time you punished me, every time you punished me, it was just. Every time you punished me, I deserved it because I was being an idiot. Because I was being dumb. Because I was sinning. Because I was doing wrong things. Because I was doing in wrong places. I was with wrong people. I was making bad choices. What I got, I deserved. But I can tell you, the times that I got spanked, I... I mean, my mom and dad, well, my mom has passed away, so not her anymore. But he used to joke about getting disciplined. You know, like, he was just, that was just me. But I didn't deserve that one. I did. I was a pain in the butt. I was, when I was a boy, I was young. I mean, boys, you don't, don't really think. You just do things. All right? Yep. Yep. All women said? Amen. Amen. All those guys said, yeah, I know. I was an idiot. But when we're disciplined, it's because God loves us. And sometimes we have a hard time separating discipline for love, that we have a hard time understanding, accepting that, that what God is doing is love. What God is doing is compassion, is right, is good. Hebrews 12, 6, the Lord disciplines those He loves, and He punishes each one He accepts as His child. We don't like it. We don't want it, but we need it. How many of us as parents to our children that we will smack hands because we know if they grab something 
it's going to be a whole lot worse. How many of us would allow a child to grab a pot off of a stove? We would never do that. Why? It's dangerous. It can hurt them severely. So what do we as parents do? We yell and we scream and we run and we grab and we pull and we aren't gentle about it. Because we're more compassionate. We, we love them. And, and frequently, God does the same with us when we're disobedient. When, I mean, we tell our kids, hey, don't touch that. It's not. They, they don't always listen, do they? They don't always understand the consequences. They don't always understand that if I do this, something bad will happen. All I know as a child is I see something on the stove. I'm hungry. I know it's food for me. I want it now. Right? And so kids grab and kids pull and kids do dumb things because they don't fully understand. We as people do the same thing. God says, hey, there are guidelines that I have for your life. And they, we call that sin. We call those mistakes. We call those things that go against God's will. And there's a reason why he says what he says. There's a reason why we can go all through kinds of all. We can go through all kinds of sin. We can talk about biggies, right? We can talk about small ones, you know, gossip. Ooh, oh, I thought you were going to talk about that. Yeah. Normally, churches say, hey, don't drink, don't smoke, don't chew, and don't date women who do. No. <laughs> oh, but what about gossip? What about slander? What about gluttony? Um, what about some of these other things that we do as Christians that we justify and we defend but are still against God's rules and God's laws. We get God's discipline because we're breaking what he knows is right and best and we don't gossip because it hurts one another. What is God compassionate, passionate about? Relationships and people. How many of us as parents would like another child gossiping about our child? We don't put up with that, do we? Well, as God looks at us, it's, a, it's like this fight that, that siblings are having. and God, He disciplines us. Rightfully so. I mean, you can't, this morning I can't go through and I can't list all of the sins that we can have and all of the disobedience that exists in our lives and all of the things that we do that breaks God's laws or that hurts God's heart or we all know. You know if you've been disobedient. You know if you look at Scripture and you, you see and you read and you've heard people like me stand up and talk and Sunday school teachers and BBS teachers and other places that, hey, this is what God says, but oh no, this is what we're doing. You know that that's sin and we're living in disobedience. And it deserves discipline. It deserves punishment. And it's only because He loves us. Now, no child would, would turn around after getting spanked or getting their hand dragged away from the stove or, you know, getting their hand smacked because they're grabbing something they shouldn't grab, would turn around and say, oh, thank you, Mommy. <laughs> thank you for spanking me. Thank you for hitting me on the butt. Thank you for putting me in a corner. Thank you. Oh, that's so loving. But... What's a child do? Screams and hollers. What do we do? We get mad and we get angry because we don't understand. And we as a parent to our child will say, I know you don't. And it's okay that you're mad, but you're safe. It's okay that you're upset. It's okay that you don't understand. It's okay. you got to trust me. The same thing is true in our relationship with Jesus. That we may not understand. We may get angry. We may get upset. And just as a parent says to the child, it's okay. I can take it. God says the same thing to us. It's okay. I can take it. I love you. I care for you. You don't understand. You don't get it. Trust me. It's for your good. It's for your benefit. There's other verse. Acts chapter 3, 19 through 20. Now repent of your sins and turn to God. Now repent of your sins and turn to God. 
motive clause so that, here's the reason, here's the rationale, their sins may be wiped away. They may be forgiven. They may be forgotten. They may no longer, no longer held against you. Then, times of refreshment will come in the presence of the Lord, and He will again send you, Jesus, your appointed Messiah. Repent so that your sins can be wiped away. Then, times of refreshment will come in the presence of the Lord. Are you feeling like God is absent from your life? Are you feeling like God may be distant from you? Are you feeling like God may not be hearing you? Are you, have you repented? Is there something in your life that is preventing that? Uh, I, again, I believe that, um, and I said this back in our first, uh, first um, talk in this series, that either we are driven into the desert or we are led into the desert. I believe desert is a benefit, is a beneficial time where we can learn and we get to experience and we get to sense God's presence in unique ways. But there are times that that distance, frequently there are times that that distance that God appears and feels to us is, be, is our own doing, is our own sin, is our own things in our life that he's like, you know what, I'm going to keep doing this anyway. Yeah, I, and we justify and we defend our behavior. We minimize. God, God, where are you? Well, we need to start with ourselves. We need to start looking at ourselves. And is it something that I've done? Is it something that, that I have said? Is it something that I have done wrong? The thing about sin, I heard this a long time ago. Sin will always take you farther than you want it to go. And it will always cost you more than you want. We can think rebellion, we can think sin, we can think disobedience is fun, and it can be for a while. But sin always takes us farther than we ever wanted to go, and always costs us more than we ever wanted to pay. Sometimes it can feel like we've gone too far. Sometimes it can feel like we've done it too often. We've, we've, we've gone down this road before, we, we circle back, and we're like, God forgive, and we end up back out there again, and we just... We, our lives feel like we're living in whiplash sometimes because we just we, we know we're guilty we feel guilty we sometimes we don't even know how to do it maybe sometimes we don't even ask for forgiveness although we want to and we need it and we know we need it and we desire it we don't ask because God there's just no way you can forgive me again and so we continue to live in this misery we continue to live in this place that is hard and this tough and this difficult because we just feel like God has given up on us I love chapter 9 of Nehemiah because it shows the breadth and the depth of God's grace. The pursuit that God has for us. That while he may feel distant and while he may seem distant and while it may, we may think that we have lived beyond and gone beyond the grace of God, and we've done more than God can ever possibly forgive or forgive again. Chapter 9 of Nehemiah shows us that when we repent and when we come back to Him and we say, God, you know, I screwed up again. I've done it again. And I'm truly sorry. This amazing, incredible what gracious and merciful God you are in your wonderful mercy. Whenever people turn to you and cry to you again for help, you listen once more from heaven. Over and over and over again. Now we can't abuse it. We all understand that, I think. I think we all understand, like, well, I can do this because God will forgive me. I can do this one more time. I can do it, well, because I know God will forgive me. <clears throat> Guilty. Guilty. Got to be careful of that spirit, that attitude, that heart. Because if we like, ah, God's grace, now we're kind of abusing it, we're taking advantage of it. Got to be careful. But if you are struggling with guilt this morning, 
or disobedience. You are tr struggling with anger. If you're, if you're struggling with hurt, if you're struggling with, God, I just can't do this again. This text, this chapter, this truth, this reality of God's hope in the desert of disobedience, His grace is there. His mercy is there. His love is there. His forgiveness is there. If we simply humble ourselves again, again, and say, I'm sorry, God, forgive me. His amazing, wonderful grace is there. He's listening from heaven. He's hearing. He's seeing. And He's ready. We carry, I think we carry guilt around sometimes like a backpack. You know, on vacation, we went hiking and we always have that hot scary first aid kit in our backpack and we carry water and we carry snacks and we, we carry these things that are um, readily available for walking in bear country, so also carry a weapon. And offend anybody by saying that, but carry a weapon uh, for safety, for protection. We, in a backpack, we can get it out, we can pull it out, we can have immediate access to it. We carry guilt like that sometimes. And we just carry it around, and then after walking, you know, eight, ten miles, that backpack starts to get heavy. It's always kind of nice when you take a drink of water and you know the home of backpacks get a little bit lighter. Let's eat lunch. Not hungry, let's eat lunch because the backpack's going to get lighter. Um, but we carry guilt around like it's in a backpack and it weighs us down and it gets heavy and it gets burdensome. And we get tired at the end of the day and we just feel worn out. Maybe in a part of your life you're feeling tired and worn out because you're, you're constantly carrying this guilt with you that I've done this and I've done that and there's no way that God can forgive me. There's no way that God can, that God can get past this because I can't get past this. I'm convinced of this. That when we carry guilt around that, around like that, um, and we've asked for forgiveness, and we truly repent it, we truly want it, we truly desire it, we're sorry, but yet we hold on to that guilt, it, it's like us, we're saying that our standard is higher than God's. That, that, that our... Uh, our degree of forgiveness and our requirements for forgiveness are higher than God's are. God's is. God says, if you repent and if you're sorry, because of the cross, because of the tomb, because of my life, you're forgiven. We're like, oh, thanks, Jesus. Not good enough. Thanks, God, but you know what? I, I still need to do something else. I, I think that's why penance. But back in the day, back a couple hundred years, you know, penance, people like that. Because now you, okay, you, you whip me, now I, I feel some physical consequence. I feel some physical pain from this. That now I can get forgiveness. Now I can receive forgiveness. And the whole time Jesus is saying, I already did that. I already went through all that. For you. Why are you carrying this guilt around? Why are you carrying this shame around? Why are you beating yourself up over this? Why are you living such a defeated life over something you've done that, that my wonderful and amazing grace is available for you? This desert of disobedience, I think, is one that we almost willingly stay in because we refuse to grace and the mercy that God has for us because we say it's too bad. I, I, I've done too much. I, I, I've said too much. I, God, there's no way. Your grace isn't big enough. Your grace isn't great enough. Your grace isn't good enough for me. For other people, yeah, okay, because they haven't done as bad in life. When we have this destructive, hurtful, self-talk that goes around in our mind, goes around in our heart that tells us a message that we're not good enough. And that's why I love chapter 9 of Nehemiah. And it may be a book that you've never read before, but you need to read chapter 9 of Nehemiah and see and experience and realize God's grace in your life 
do your desert in disobedience. We're going to close the service in just a minute. We're going to sing a song. And we're going to go out and we're going to leave this place. You can choose what you do with that backpack of shame. What you do with that backpack of guilt. The, the continuing in disobedience. If you're continuing to live in disobedience. You can't stop that. You can change that today in this moment. Because I, I can promise you, if you haven't done anything, it's not recorded in the pages of this book. I can promise you that what people have done in this book, you haven't, you haven't killed, I hope. You killed people? Well, there's murderers in here that have been forgiven. Adulterers? There's adulterers in here that have been forgiven. And you, you can't come up with anything that hadn't been listed in this Bible. But people that God forgave and that God used. Prostitutes? Prostitutes is in Jesus' genealogy. I think it's pretty cool. I think it's pretty awesome. God took a prostitute hundreds of years before he was born. I want her to be my great-great-grandmother. That's pretty awesome. That's the kind of grace Jesus offers us in disobedience. And, and it's, you know, it, it's work, it's a process to let go of anger, to let go of bitterness, to let go of resentment of God. Why? I get that. I understand that. Live it. Some of you asked about I talked, I said we're going to talk about Job. We are going to get to Job. I want you to stick around to hear about Job. So I get the resentment that we can carry around and the anger that we can carry. But understand God's grace is bigger and greater than anything that you have done, any of your disobedience, any of that baggage that you're carrying around. God's grace is bigger. It's not up to us to accept it. Now, I don't, we don't have an altar up here. Um, I would love to have a conversation with you. Um, if this is I'm talking to you this morning, the Holy Spirit is talking to you. If this is something that you're struggling with, that you're carrying around, maybe you don't know how to get out. Let me know somehow. I'm going to write a note, send me an email, text something that we can talk, just one on one. I would love to do that because there's a freedom that God has for us that is indescribable. It's just up to us to accept it. Um, so as Sarah wants you come, yeah, I'm going right here. Um, I just want you to sit and think and process and allow God's spirit, His voice, in this very unique way to speak to your heart, to encourage you this morning. Maybe to challenge you. Maybe you've been wondering, why has this been happening in my life? Maybe it's because you're living in disobedience. It may not be. But it's something that we need to consider. It's something that we need to examine. God, am I doing something that, that you're trying to get my attention? That you're trying to get my attention. So as we, as we close the service, just, just really trying to focus on this spirit speaking to your heart and speaking to your mind and pulling things out. Right?